Hello and welcome to the 153rd episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Thursday the 11th of March 2021 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. This week I'm delighted to welcome Herman Luer to the show to discuss his recent translation into English, the second edition, The Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution by the Group of International Communists. This book has truly blow my mind over the last few weeks and months and hopefully Herman and myself can translate some of our enthusiasm for this amazing work of political economy to y'all. I'd like to give a real heartfelt thanks to all my patrons whose contributions really do help me pay my bills since my computer work has finally ground to a halt due to COVID. If you too would like to help keep the lights on and the episodes flowing please head on over to Patreon where for only $5 a month you get access to a heap of bonus episodes and live streams and of course to the Emancipation Network Discord where we have constant lively discussion on everything from theory to commie gossip. Okay, let's join the interview. Herman, thanks very much for speaking with us today. I've recently read your translation of it's the second edition of The Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution, released by Red and Black Books. I've also read another book by you on the same title, which is kind of a discussion of the topic. This book blew my mind. I uh, was extremely Im- impressed with it as a work of political economy. One of the few really good ones I've read of, say, a communist or socialist political economy. Where the hell did you come across this, Herman? And tell us, tell us how you got into it. Uh, yes, it was uh, nearly the same for me. Maybe 10 years ago, uh, I was not aware of this uh, brilliant book. And I had uh, written um, already some books, critic of uh, capitalism. And um, I held some lectures on, on those books. And uh, often the question arose, what is the alternative after I explained my critic of uh, capitalism? And um, therefore, I decided to write a book critique of capitalism and the question of the alternative. And with this book, I digged more into this subject of the alternative. And uh, at that time, I was, of course, aware of um, what Marx wrote in the Gotha, in the critique of the Gotha program, and also what Friedrich Engels wrote in anti During. And here, more or less, the same is said. So it's, it's uh, in, in very brief uh, words, it was not their main subject, but in very brief words, they described what the group of international communists later took up in a more extended version. And while I was thinking about this and writing about this, I searched in the internet for the topic, and then I had the same surprise as, <laughs> as you mentioned. I suddenly found a book which had more or less a title of what I wanted to write. And uh, then I say, hey, what's that? And I was even more surprised when I read the book. And this was the first edition. The second edition was at that time not available in German and, and not in English either. So I read the first edition and I think this is, is already a very good book. And then I, I wrote also this uh, book, which you showed me, The Fundamental Principle. So there's the same title, which is my book, explaining a little bit in short. And, and I tried to do it in very simple words, what, what the content of, of the original books of, of the group of international communists uh, was. Because the, the book of the international communists, I think it's brilliant, but it's, uh, it's 80 years old. And of course, it's had a little bit the time of uh, when they wrote it in a book. So when they discuss uh, Neurath or Kautsky, then this is not what you today would discuss. And therefore, I thought the book is, and the, and, and the way they describe this is so brilliant that I thought I have to put it into actual words into actual wording and uh, give it a short summary which is in the intention of the group of international communists which is readable also for workers because i i think it should be not an academical thing it should be really something which people can make use of so and this um, i did with this uh, little small book with the same uh, title and then came the next surprise to me uh, someone from from netherlands he had found this book 
And he contacted me and said, that's uh, very interesting. I really like this book. And he said, uh, do you know that there's a second edition? A second edition, which is an extended version, which is uh, it's an improved version. And I said, no, it's a joke. And uh, he said, oh, it's, uh, it's in, in Dutch. And it's never translated in, in any other language. And first I said, this can't be true. It's 80 years <laughs> after the first edition appeared. And the first edition, the interesting thing with the first edition, I come back to the second edition. Later. The interesting thing with the first edition is um, the manuscript was written uh, uh, 1923 in prison by Jan Appel. And um, the first edition came out uh, 1930. And as far as I know, it was forbidden and confiscated. So there are only very few books uh, still available from the first edition. And they, of course, were disappointed that they could not distribute their book any longer. And then uh, they had not enough money to bring out a new edition. And then they decided to rewrite or to improve the first edition by publishing this in, in the Netherlands in a political magazine which was uh, published only in the Netherlands. And um, there, first in, in several editions, uh, the new version, which they improved and extended, uh, came out. And then in, in 1935, this second edition came out as, as a book as well, but in Dutch language and only on the Dutch market. And there, this is really the absolutely strange thing, I could not believe it, there it remained for 80 years. And simply nobody realized it. And, and I think it's it's one of the major books of um, Marxist literature. I would <laughs> I would say it is. And this book, yeah, it's it slept uh, for for eighty years in in the Dutch language. So and when I when I realized this, it was for me clear that this book has to be translated. And I, together with the, with the Dutch guy and uh, support from him. I translated this first into German, and then an English translation came out as well. So this is this is, from my side, the history of this this great book. And uh, as I said, I was as surprised as as you were when when I realized that that this was available. Yeah, it's a it's an amazing book. It kind of it makes you think on like I don't know. It, it's it's kind of staggering that such a good book was lost to the void. What is your what is the reception been you've had since you have done a German and a and a and an English translation? Have you had much interest in it? Yeah, it's uh, it was a book which uh, not caught so much uh, attention when it came out the, the, in the first edition. I think it was after it was confiscated, it was lost, and then in the seventies there was a reprint in Germany, and then it was also translated into English and French. Uh, so it was during the student revolts um, there was a little bit interest in this book, and then it disappeared once again. And now, yes, now it's available in at least uh, three languages, and of course there are a couple of hundred books sold now. So there is there is an interest in the book. It's not that it's absolutely useless uh, the effort, but of course it's it's still a niche book, and it's for me it's strange. And I try to answer this also a little bit in my in my preface to the book. Why can this happen? That such a book, which is really taking up Marx and Engels' thoughts about the communist society, because it's exactly what they do. And they extend this in a more scientific way. And so what Marx and Engels had not the time for, because this was not their main issue at that time. How can it be that such a book is so, get, get so less intention from, from uh, left-wing people? And my answer to this, and I, I feel this is, is, this is true, this is also the reactions which I got from many sides, is that on the left-wing side, there is one big group, which are more looking for market socialism. And this is absolutely not what they are writing. So the, the book of the group of international communists, and I would say also of Marx, is a fundamental critic of uh, the Soviet-style uh, socialism and of uh, the anarchist political economy as well. And therefore, the big groups on the anarchist side and also on the, on the party communist side they, they simply don't like it. And while we know that the anarchists don't like Marx, it's of course a little bit strange that the Marxists don't like Marx either. 
but it's it's really the case. <laughs> they don't like it. I get I got comments from from left wing side, which I, I really was wondering that uh, <laughs> because Marx wrote the same thing. They I think they would never argue against Marx in this way. They have a different interpretation of Marx said, but I would not argue against it. <laughs> it's quite funny. It seems to operate against the interests of many people. Like before we get into the book so much, but like there's a brilliant part in it where he breaks down the political economy of social democrats like the SPD, the right wing of the SPD, the Bolsheviks as radical social democrats that end up with like market socialism, you know, the anarchist trade union syndicalism, which defaults into a plan, you know, a market socialism, the libertarian communists that devolve into a market socialism. And he shows how all of them devolve into this other thing away from like the intention of what Marx meant by socialism and communism. And so like, <laughs> you know, he essentially made enemies probably of all the dominant left factions of their time and, and still the dominant left factions of today. Can you tell us a little bit about the group of international communists and, and who these people were? <clears throat> yes, it's not really so much known about uh, them. So they they always wrote under the name uh, Group of International Communists and they were not really interested. So, for instance, Jan Appel always wrote under synonyms. There are a few things he, he wrote under, I think the name was Hempel. And I think the main guys behind the group of international communists are Jan Appel and Henk Kahnemeyer. From what I read is that they they are the most, most uh, the, the driver behind the group and and uh, wrote most of of, uh, of their papers. And sometimes it's said that Anton Pannekoek would be also a member of the group. But from what I heard, this is not really the case. He he was also associated to them. He was uh, writing together with them. They had they had a publication um, next to their books, uh, which was Rete Correspondence in Germany, so Council Correspondence, uh, which is also an interesting paper where they have a lot of interesting articles they wrote during this time from, I think it was from 2025 20, to 31 or so, or 35. And then, then this uh, council course then, then disappeared. But Anton Panikok, from what I read from his books, he is he's not so much in the political economy of the council communism. He is more, more in the traditional way. He is focusing on the power side, so the decentralized organization of the, of the council organization. And but what he, what is missing in his books, I I, I find is exactly what the group of international communists brought up, that the council communism is nothing if there is not a political economy, the right political economy. This is a foundation, this is a basic on which you can, can operate councils. But without this material basis, it's, it's nothing. And I think this is also a clear Marxist thought. It, it was what uh, Marx always said, that it's, the political economy is, is, a, is a crucial thing and not what what develops above i think there is also um if we take this what what happened in the in the in the russian revolution i think what what's really interesting is that um in 1921 so two years before jan appel wrote the manuscript and he wrote it as a critique of what what he saw what is happening in in the russian revolution he was disappointed what he saw there and therefore this this was his driving part why why he thought he, he had to write it down and i think the interesting thing is if if you if you see what what happened on the on the 10th party congress in 1921 in russia I, I think you are familiar with the dispute between lenin and and the workers opposition uh, and this was was really a discussion uh, around uh, more power to the councils, and the mistake of the of the workers' opposition was similar to what what I mentioned from Panico, that they that they had no clue of the political economy, so and therefore Lenin was more or less right in criticizing them as a syndicalistic deviation from the party. It's right. Without this um, political economy, which really builds the foundation of 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 the of the council organization, 
it could not it could not become a real critique of the soviet style socialism and this is i think this is a main or this is one of the main points of this book i i feel it has has really three three messages one is um, the political economical basis for the abolition of exploitation and the second is a political economical basis for the establishment of the association of the free and equal people and the, the third is a fundamental critique of the political economy of the soviet style socialism and as you said of the anarchism as well so so these are the three treasure i would say which which you can find in this book so do we know anything about this yana pell character there's a little bit in the book he sounds like a very bad man do you want to tell us a little bit of his of any of any of the stories you know of him? Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know so much about him, and and frankly, I'm not so much interested in in, in the personal background of this. Um, I, I think the the political thing of the book is the main thing, but but of course, it's it's interesting. Uh, his biography is is uh, interesting. So and I think on one speech you've, there is also a text in the internet. I, I quoted also the, the the text there. You can find it. I think it's in German. Uh, could be that there is also an English translation. There there was one speech and there he he gave a few indications of his biography. And there is of course this nice story that he wanted to present the position of the uh, his position to to Lenin uh, and they they kidnapped a boat. In order to drive to the to the Congress uh, in, in in Moscow, <laughs> which was of course crazy, but indeed they did this, and he managed to get an audience with Lenin, and Lenin reacted uh, his ideas with uh, yeah with a quote from his unpublished critique of the left wing <laughs> radicalism. <laughs> yeah, that's but this is the only thing what I know about him. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a bad man. You know, I, I uh, as a bit of a nerd in all of this stuff, Herman, I, I really liked the the way he was shooting bullets at Neurath and Kautsky and Varga and some of these guys. But but what's kind of amazing is as well is that like when you read, I read the first edition first, so that's in twenty three. He started writing that when he was in prison for stealing that boat, and the second edition was I think what did you say nineteen thirty one. 35. Yeah, okay. So the predictions and the analysis that he gave like in 1923 today when you read it, it's kind of amazing. Before like the Soviet experiment had really unfolded down its merry path, he basically laid out exactly the problems with it. And that really speaks to the strength of his analytical framework. Yes, that's right, and of course, um, it was if if you have read Marx and understood Marx, then then it was clearly foreseeable what 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 was happening in in, in Russia. So, what what did they do there? Of course, they had um, very difficult times with the civil war and and with the war from 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 the Western countries uh, against the revolution. Uh, that's for sure. But when when they have won the civil war and and could uh, organize their communist societies. And the first, what, what they did uh, is they tried to, to, to organize a central planning in kind. So without a, a measure. So they, they abolished the money. So this, this more or less they understood from Marx that, that they had to abolish money and com commodities. But they did not really understand and they, they, they don't want to see it that, that of course they have to replace money as a, as a measure for, for the economy, as, as, a, as a ratio for the economy. They have to replace it with something. And as we said before, Marx and Engels pointed it out, in, not only in the critique of Gotha, but also in, in several parts of, the, of his main work, The Capital, you, you find some wordings which clearly say that this was obvious for him. And, and if you read the anti during what, what Engels writes, and it's absolutely obvious for him that, that you need a measure in order to organize the communist economy. 
So what, what they tried is, and this is also nicely written uh, in, in the book of the group of international communists, they, they really tried to, to abolish the money and they ended in chaos. And they ended really there what the, the bourgeois uh, critique Ludwig von Mises, he, he also predicted it and said, socialism um, without money, and he can only think money, of course, uh, socialism without money is abolition of rationality in, in of the economy. And I think he's absolutely right. And the interesting thing is, and this was, of course, what uh, Jan Appel saw in 23. Then already they changed their policy because they ended up in chaos. And, and instead of now saying, OK, we need, we, we take, uh, as Marx and Engels suggested, we take the working time measure in order to organize uh, the society together with the council organization, Lenin decided to take the value as a measure. With his uh, new policy, he really introduced the capitalist value again. And this was, of course, a starting point uh, which went through the whole history of the Soviet Union. Discussions about more or less market. And it ended with Gorbachev, who, as a communist, uh, it's ridiculous, said, I think market and, uh, and uh, central planning is not a contradiction, so we can do both. So, and then he into capitalism, as we know. So I think it, it from, from, from this point of view, it was absolutely clear for Jan Appel. He could see what, what happens. Yeah, it's kind of amazing when just as a work of theory and a work of political economy, it, it's quite starting. The second edition now, it introduces some like actual historical evidence from the Soviet experiment. Interestingly, he talks about how the trade unions were integrated into the Soviet system and actually ended up working against the interests of the Workers' Council and this kind of battle between the Workers' Council as the kind of spontaneous organization of the workers and the existing institutions of the workers like trade unions and how they became a tool of oppression to go against the strikes against the state at that time. So it's a very, very clear kind of extemporation, if that's the correct word, uh, a clear description of how these class forces within this new state operated once you had the value form reinstated in the early 20s. Yes. And if you read statements from Lenin, what, what he thought about the communist societies, and you can see already in the beginning that he, he did not think about an association of, uh, of workers who control their work and their work product and organize based on, on this, uh, their economy and, and their working place. This was never his idea. His idea was uh, that he takes over the, the big companies, the post, uh, the big banks, and turns them into a socialist economy. So it's a little bit a uh, social democratic idea, I think. And therefore, of course, they, they got within the company, uh, within the party, I think they got some discussion if this is right uh, during the time of 21. And so with the workers' uh, opposition, which they pointed at, at the point that, that the workers are working under miserable conditions and so and then they had discussions like this, but in the end, he, he could not think, it's strange, he could not think that uh, the workers by themselves must and can control and steer the economy. If, if you give them the information, the systematic information about uh, working time. So if, if this is organized, and, and this is, I think this is a major issue after the revolution, that this is organized, the working time calculation. And based on this, then the society can grow in a decentralized way because everybody understands how much work corresponds to how much consumption in a, in a, in a, in a social labor division. So it's it's really quite similar to, to a capitalist economy, but on the other hand, it's a huge difference. Yeah, like that's got to be kind of something that I've been talking to people and kind of trying to hammer home is the idea that, you know, capital capitalism has its own calculation device, you know, it's called the market. 
and it doesn't have it doesn't have the the central bank is not deciding everything it, there's there's not a goss plan in capitalism but capitalism still has functions of planning you know it still decides where to build roads how to do stuff but it's not like socialism can't have its own decentralized version not a market but its own decentralized production and it's not a given and in fact as the argument that's made in this book is that like any kind of a central plan you know a central plan in the in the essence of like it controlling all facets of of production from the top will necessarily sit above and and eventually against the workers in 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 the society so like that's something i feel like that is lost time and time again in discussions on the left whereby the uh, you know i talk about the marxist left mainly you know this idea of the dire need for ultra centralization of planning it it doesn't it doesn't flow from the political economy of marx or engels the centralization you mean yeah yes no exactly so otherwise they would have never written about uh, the association of, of free and equal people. This, this has nothing to do with centralization. Centralization means wage labor. And I think it's, it's, it's right. Uh, capitalism is a mixture of, of central planning and decentralized planning. So the consumers decide what they want. They order somewhere. But of course, there's also central planning necessary, and it's it's everywhere. It's it's not not a free free decentralized market which steers the whole thing. And I think it's it's of course exactly the same in the communist society based on the working time calculation. So if you if you see the capitalism is the measure for for the decentralized capitalist economy is money, and what is money? Money is I would say is materialized violence, or you can say it's materialized exploitation, because we know in, in the money, so when, as a Marxist, when, when you know how exploitation goes, and then it's, of course, in capitalism, it's different to, to slavery or, or, or the feudalism. So it's not a, not, not a personal violent relationship. You are my slave. And, and you work for me and I eat the fruits of your labor. So then it's obvious that there is violence. And, uh, but in, 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 in capitalism, we know that uh, exploitation goes uh, in, a, in, a, in a factual way, in the way that you happen to have no money, I happen to have money, I can buy your labor power. With buying your labor power, I own the product of your work and I can live from the difference of what I pay for you for the labor power and what I get from the from the product which which I own now, which you work for, which I sell. So this this is a, this is a secret in 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 capitalism behind uh, exploitation. And money is of course is is nothing else than, than the materialized violence relationship because with the money i get from buying your labor power on selling the product i have this exploitation i have it in the money in, in a factual thing not it's not not anymore a, a, a personal relation so and with this money now the whole decentralized economy runs as a measure so cost price calculation is this materialized exploitation and the simple thing is now what what's, what Marx has uh, said and what a group of international communists bring up with the fundamental principles. If you simply change the measure from money to working time, then you have abolished exploitation. Because if 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 the workers claim hundred percent of their work, then there is no exploitation left. This this means it's, it's at the same time the, the the takeover of the of the means of production to the people, and then they steer the whole economy through a measure which has no exploitation in it. So on the surface it looks quite similar because now I can order. I I know I have worked, say five hours. I know what is uh, on on the on the basis of the of the average uh, productivity of the society. I know that say an iPad takes so much hours. 
then I know what I can consume, what I can in the division of labor, what I can consume. And everything can run on the surface, very similar. I can order my products and the decentralized organization of the manufacturing units know what they have to produce. The simple thing is only that the purpose of the economy has absolutely changed. It's not the private profit, but it's satisfaction of the needs of, of the people, which drives now the economy. Yeah, no, it's it's amazing, like the kind of simplicity of it, like this simple change of a measure. But it is this transparency of the labor time calculation, which gets rid of this, uh, you know, hiding of the relations that is in capitalism. You know, capitalism, you feel like you're getting a fair trade, getting your wage for your labor because you're you're alienated from the output of your labor. You know, the whole thing is hidden in fog. But like the, the clarity of the measure of labor time totally ex explodes that myth of the fair exchange of labor power for a wage. And that, that's the that's the real beauty of this other calculating measure. But there's also this kind of second core thing in the book that the, the writers, Jan Appel, really hammers is the idea of the need for the unity between the production. So the, the need of the, the unity between the producers and their product. So this idea of the problems with, say, a central planning approach or a social democrat approach or what would have been an anarcho-syndicalist approach at the time was that they would, in effect, have to have a price policy. And a price policy means that the value of the object that you've just created won't have the same price necessarily as the amount of labor in. And once you change the relationship between the the product the producer and the product they produce, that this leads down the road to price policy and then some people not getting what their their labor is worth. And you end up right back where you started in capitalism with a mystifying unit of measure. No, but but it's it's uh, I think it's it's a correct description of what happens if if you if you start with this price uh, policy and and go away from the direct relation between work and product, which is the labor time and nothing else. So the difficult thing I think is um, you have two two levels, you, two abstraction levels. You can say uh, when you try to implement this working time. The one side, and, and this is where they start with, is the idea that you can completely organize the economy through working time calculation. So you have 100% link between working time and what you take. And they said, unfortunately, and they really said, unfortunately, this is not 100% possible. And in, in some areas, you don't perhaps even want it. So, for instance, healthcare education, care for, for elderly, people who are sick, who are young or can, can for, for some reason not work. Of course, you have to care for them. And this is exactly what, what Marx also wrote when, when he, in a bracket, said after deduction for the reserve funds, you can use this measure of working time calculation. And this, of course, makes it a little bit more complicated because you have an area where you have to deduct something from the individual work time accounts in order to use this um, social labor for parts which are not linked to the working time measure, which are free to take. And I think one of the big misunderstandings of people who read this book, is for instance, it's, uh, it's uh, I think, a big misunderstanding of Paul Matic, who wrote uh, the preface to the first edition. He argues that, yes, the working time calculation is fine, perhaps it's necessary, but then in the next stage, we go to take what you need and a social product, so which is not linked. And I think this is absolutely a mistake, because even if it's in some areas necessary to, to, to work with those reserve funds, I think it is 
for the people, if they want to steer their economy by themselves, then it's it's always necessary to have the working time disclosed, which is linked to it. So take, for instance, if you take water or electricity, of course, you could imagine that it's the best it's free. But I would say it's not good if, if it's free. If I don't know how much work time of the society is associated to water or to electricity or so, something else, I cannot make a rational decision about my consumption of those products. So this means the more I drive this society or away from, from, the, from the direct link to the working time, the more I come into the direction of a planning in kind. And then I'm there where uh, the Soviet, where Lenin uh, got his disaster. So therefore, it's, uh, I think this is, this is a point which, which I found in, in many discussions, which people don't understand, that this is, not, this is not the higher stage of communism. No, it begins after the revolution with the implementation of the working time calculation. There is no higher stage. And the strange thing is that Marx, he wrote something about the higher stage. And this is always quoted when people say, now working time calculation, this is wage labor. Many people misunderstand it in this way. And they say, Marx said that this is still a bourgeois juridical standpoint. And, and the real communism, the higher stage uh, starts when, when you can go away from this working time calculation. And I think it's absolutely a mistake because if you read what Marx wrote there, then he writes more or less of an economy which is 100% automated. He, he really writes, when we reach a stage where the productivity is developed in a way that the necessary work disappears and the work becomes an uh, interest by itself, then you can, the famous phrase, to each according their needs and from each according to their abilities. This idea, they call it this, uh, the FIC is, it's, it's like essentially like a, it's kind of like a communist or a socialist tax rate. You know, what percentage of your income, your labor time income goes towards parts of consumption that are free at the point of use? It's kind of like equivalent. So there's so many, what's amazing about this book, there's so many like communist parallels to capitalist forms that it's, it's kind of a startling. In capitalism, you could also introduce a 100% tax rate and then you have a central planning. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So like if we, like if we had this tax rate, say it's 25% now and as we become we have we have the revolution and twenty five percent is going towards consumption on the base of needs and there's like in in the book he says that there, there it would probably be a tendency towards that to to increase but the thing is even if you got to a hundred percent where everything was on the base of needs to run your economy rationally you would still need to essentially keep records of the labor that's going into these positions so that you can make rational choices about say will we build a rocket ship to go to jupiter and so you could actually see what it would cost your economy even if everything was free it would still be a measure that would help us to coordinate yeah it's it's absolutely right um if you if you stop to measure it in this way then then you're in a planning of kind which uh, as ludwig von mises say this is not possible and uh so therefore, it's, there is a tendency, I, I, I think it's right, there is a tendency that a communist society develops into this direction where more and more is, as, as you call it, text and goes into this uh, basic form. But this is a risk, and I think society must be aware of this risk, that the more, the more it goes in this direction, the more the people lose control over their society. Getting back a bit to the kind of historical stuff, there was an amazing quote you had in it. I was just looking for it there. I can't find it now. But it was uh, of Karl Liebknecht. And he was talking in the 1880s, I think, about the SPD. And where he said, like, the fight is to, to have a revolution where we have abolished the wage form and everything else is just like a form of capitalism. And then the next 
paragraph was essentially saying and then in in 1900 or whatever the party changed its platform to go towards like a so, the social democrat view so we see early on in the party it did have the kind of correct analysis the roots of it at least maybe not as elegantly expounded or elegantly told as in this you know great book but we saw that early on in the SPD the policy was changed towards the social democrat approach and I don't know what you think about this but it seems like so that the initial groups that formed were forgive me if I got the, the pronunciations wrong but the Lasallians and the uh, Eisenachers that we had like the nearly the Sock Dem, the future Sock Dem wing and the Marxist wing joined together. And that contradiction played its way out in kind of ditching the kind of proper approach by the, by the early 1900s. Yes, it's right. Uh, there was an awareness, and but this got lost and it's still lost up to today, which is really a surprise. It's also a surprise after the, the disaster with the Soviet-style uh, socialism. It's really a surprise that, yeah, that this idea and the awareness of this, what uh, Marx and Engels wrote, is completely lost and was for 80 years buried in uh, the Dutch language. <laughs> Do you speak Dutch, Herman? No. <laughs> Can you... Is it too no, hard? It's is it, can it's, you understand yeah, it? Yeah, a little bit, but not really. So, but I could manage it uh, together with a Dutch guy, and we together, I think, we managed to translate it. And the interesting thing was also <clears throat> first when I translated the second edition, I thought, okay, they changed a little bit uh, the content and the structure, and they added something. But it would be quite easy because I have the first edition, which I wrote originally in German, and I can simply copy and paste the parts which I did not change. But then I discovered that even if there are, say, maybe 50% or 60% very close in the, in the wording and in the paragraphs and, and so from the first edition, it's not really the same. So I, I really compared this uh, sentence by sentence and realized they, they, changed the, they changed the book completely. So therefore, I think it's it's a big gain to have this uh, improved version available now. Yeah, just getting back to that point as well, that they kind of, it's amazing how there's basically the communist solution that they come up with that is true to Marx's work. It seems to have these mirror forms to capitalism, which is very... Very interesting. Like, the, you know, we have the concept of socially necessary labor time and capitalism. We have the average social reproduction time or whatever. They give it a few different names. You know, we, we still have a kind of a market mechanism, not the same market, but we have a link between the distributive cooperatives and the production ones that are able to balance supply and demand issues in a communist society. We have the equivalent in the, what they call their gyro, which is an interesting name for it, their central accounting uh, council, where they record the transactions, mimics quite closely the functions of a bank under capitalism. You know, it's kind of, it's kind of incredible. Like when I think in my head, when I think previous to reading the book and I think about like what I thought about communism and a lot of it was, not so clearly formed but when i i read this and how everything is so incredibly clear and weirdly like similar to capitalism it kind of really makes me think about how communism really is like born out of the social relations of capitalism there is so much that is so similar yet changes in content Changed the system entirely. Yes, it's 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 right. It, it's uh, on the surface, it it's looks very similar. But uh, essential thing, the the measure, as a materialized exploitation or or as a, as, a, as a abolition of of exploitation, um, the measure changed, and this is a huge difference. And and I I can read um, you know this, and this is a very famous part. Uh, what Marx uh, wrote. He said, 
I think it was uh, in the critique of Gotha. Here, obviously, the same principle prevails as that which regulates the exchange of commodities, as far as this exchange of equal values. Content and form are changed because under the altered circumstances, no one can give anything except his labor, and because, on the other hand, nothing can pass to the ownership of the individual except the individual means of consumption. So I think here, here exactly he said it. There is no... In the form, there is no big difference. And I think this is also an interesting point. Sometimes people are a little bit irritated. They think, yeah, it would be nice to overcome capitalism, but how should it work? And then, then they think, because they think about the Soviet-style uh, central planning, which not not worked. And, and they, they think, no, it's, it's not possible. Or they think about everybody can take what he wants. Yeah, of course, it would be crazy uh, without measure. So and, and then they come to the conclusion that maybe, uh, yeah, capitalism there is no alternative to capitalism. And I think what what they show here in, in in the book is it's so simple, it's so simple also to run this decentralized from, from the people's decision. So the people really can 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 steer it. So it starts in the, in the in the manufacturing unit where the people decide about how their working place is organized. And with the, with the, with the working time measures, they can, uh, with their orders of, of what they want to have and the social division of labor, they can organize this very similar to uh, today's solutions. But of course, with a huge difference um, due to the difference of the measure, there would be, of course, no low labor countries anymore. And the, this, this would change everything. So there, there would be no need to ship material around the world and and produce something here and sail it on the other side of the planet so all this would automatically disappear and even if the form is, is more or less the same due to the, the different content it would change the complete world that's a very good point i never even thought about that herman that's an amazing point because the things would all be priced at their labor time so because you're paying a Chinese worker or a Kenyan worker a tenth of a Western worker, it makes no difference. It's the price no of the reason, product is no the same. To, to produce uh, washing machines um, or cars in, in China anymore. And that would introduce a huge amount of efficiency from an ecological point of view. Like what we see, you know, in the Western countries, we, we hear this PR, hot air, that the West, Germany or Ireland or the United States have decoupled their CO2 production from GDP growth. And in reality, it's nonsense. They have located the CO2 emissions to a different country for value production reasons. And then they ship the surplus back to the core and consume it. But the production is like, it's just being shipped somewhere else, you know, and that... The one of the greatest polluters in the like two of the greatest polluters are actually um both air but also by sea because sea tends to the the tankers tend to burn very crude oil they 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 burn heavy oils which are highly highly polluting so like a huge amount of this stuff we should hope to disappear there's another great bit in the book as well herman if you could talk about it for us is their interpretation of the idea of the dictatorship of the proletariat and how that works with all of this. Uh, yeah, the dictatorship uh, of the proletariat is, of course, not a, a personal dictatorship any longer with, uh, with the solution they suggest, but a factual um, dictatorship based on the working time need for the products you produce. Of course, you cannot consume things without spending labor on it, as long as, as is not everything automated. It's, of course, you cannot simply pick things and, and don't care about the work. So it's not the society uh, which dictates this, but it's nature, you can say, which dictates that you can only consume what you have worked for. And so if you make this transparent and if you organize the whole economy with this concept, then then you can say that, of course, this this dictates to the people what what is realistic, what is rational, and what is not rational. So, but this is not a 
dictatorship is an exploitation, but this is uh, this is a dictatorship of ratio. There, there is an interesting kind of point they make with respect to say the peasantry or the agricultural sector, where they talk about if that the modern agricultural sector are not self sufficient. You know, they they are two specialists. You know, they are specialists in the production of wheat or corn or cattle or sheep and that if they were if there was a council communist revolution in the cities in the developed parts that the the farmers could not say not take part in it because they need to sell their produce and they can be essentially forced by the dictatorship of the proletariat into signing up to the terms of the proletariat it, not in a way that's like barrel of the gun, but just through the necessity of them being able to reproduce themselves. And thus, through this kind of dictatorship of the proletariat, we have a recombining of all of the different elements into society into this one giant unit. It's a very different and very easy to understand kind of version of the concept compared to like what is commonly thought. Yeah, if I understand you correctly, of course there, there is a, there is a need of a of a common rule. So um, so it's it's not a society which is you, can, you as, as Lenin said I think correctly you cannot live in a society and be free of it. So <laughs> and this is of course correct and and so there must be a, a common rule but this rule serves all the people and, and their needs and of course a, a communist society cannot uh, cannot live and cannot organize uh, itself if this common rule is not accepted so this is i think it's a starting point of the revolution that the people understand that this is a benefit of the majority this is to stick to this rule and to organize this is the benefit of the majority. And if, if the majority understands this and if they change this, if they demand the, the, uh, the full yield of their, of their work, in the very moment they do this, private poverty uh, of the means of production will disappear. But as long as they don't do this, it will not disappear. And of course, in, in this way, it's, um, and this is for the farmers as well. It's, uh, it's a need to understand this. But if the people understand this and if they implement this, then they have a communist society. Yeah, I find, I just find the book really, really brilliant. German, I, I'm very pleased you've done a, a translation of it. Like, it seems to me that I could sit down with anybody I know and if I had half an hour and explain stuff to them, not not talking about Marxists, just talking about regular folks, I think that they could look at it and go, well, that seems to make a lot of sense. <laughs> you know, that it's it, it's demystifying. I, I agree. I feel that this you can explain, say, a normal to a normal worker or to, to people who are not so political or so, so you can explain it to him. And I, I feel also if if more people try to 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 push this thought and, and this idea, then there's a real chance to to get people behind it. What is strange for me is you cannot explain this to Marxists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, uh, yeah. What what can I say to that? <laughs> it was a little bit of a joke, but but it's no, it's true. <laughs> no, I, I'm I 100 agree with you. <laughs> it's like there is nothing worse than Marxists. Let's get that straight. <laughs> As a Marxist, I hate all Marxists. <laughs> That's right. But uh, yes, yeah, therefore, I was happy to see that you that you uh, found this book and that you like this book and that you want to push the idea a little bit more. And I think it would, yeah, it's necessary. It makes me like as well. I, it's very interesting because, like, with the you know the emergence of Bitcoin, what's now eight nine years ago, distributed ledger that it's encrypted. And hard, you know, not easy to break that everybody could look at. 
this idea of the blockchain technology, it just struck me as like, you know, a decentralized accounting way that every transaction by every thing that's bought and sold could be held in a place that you cannot change. Everybody could see the records of this piece of wood was chopped down in a forest in Scotland, went to Germany to a a place to make into furniture was then brought and sold to like somebody in Czechoslovakia. And then you could see who paid for it and where they got their money for working in this factory. And you could follow the flows of the entire economy. It just seems like there are so many elements that like that where this stuff just falls into very, particularly now with computers and information technology, the solution just seems it seems like the material conditions for develop for to develop this stuff is just ripe. Yes, it's 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 right. Uh, development of the information technology is of course helpful as uh, as a development of the productivity at all is, is helpful, but um, it will not uh, solve the problem. But because as long as the content of this uh, information technology is still the materialized uh, violence relationship, then there's, there's no help from, from this side. And, and um, you can also say, also without this information technology, 100 years ago, you could have introduced a working time calculation without problems. Because the capitalist enterprises say they show it every day that they can calculate from, from raw material to the end product exactly and what, what they do, they, they calculate also in, in, in some kind of working time, but working time on an exploitation level. So, so it's, 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 there is it's no change. You, you calculate working time and in the future in the communist society you would also calculate working time, but a working time which does not allow exploitation any longer. That's, that's the whole thing. It's, it's so simple. This book has... I used to think that perhaps I, I did. I, I'll be honest. I thought that if you had asked me one month ago, did I think it would have been possible maybe in the twenties to have communist planning? Just communism would it have worked with the material conditions? I would have. I would have had the position no. But in this book, they make the case for how it's very simple to do it decentralized. How just like capitalism does, but with a different measure. And I fully believe it could have been introduced in the twenties absolutely no problem so it's completely changed my outlook on this stuff you know i think this is after like maybe capital this is the book that's kind of impressed me most of any political economy i've ever read exactly the same for me On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. And if you'd like to help out the show, please remember to head over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar.